camera sliders are one of those things that became incredibly popular with the rise of DSLR video about a decade ago, but that doesn't mean they've slid out of the spotlight. In fact, I've recently started using a new camera slider that'll make you say, Mano, the Nano is incredible. One of the keys to making a successful YouTube video is to keep things as clear and concise as possible. So naturally, I'm gonna do exactly the opposite and give you an in-depth retrospective look at the role camera sliders have played in my own video production journey, along with the role that they've played in the world of independent content creation over the past decade. And make no mistake, this is ultimately a review of the iFootage Shark Slider Nano. So feel free to slide over the chapter markers if needed. But if you want the full context of why this thing is awesome and why camera sliders are definitely not quote unquote, a thing of the past, then stick around. And this video is not sponsored by iFootage. They did send me the Shark Slider Nano for free, which is awesome because I really wanted one but there's no obligation on my part to make a video. I don't have to say anything specific about it. They don't get to look at the video. And I'd really encourage you to take a look at the ethics statement on my website if you wanna know how I handle free products, reviews, objective content, and all that kind of stuff. That's there for everybody to check out. And iFootage sent me the bundle package of the Shark Slider Nano, which has an MSRP of $669 at the time that I'm recording this video. The bundle includes the slider itself, a USB-C charging cable, a carrying case, an NPF 750 battery, a smartphone mount, and five different shutter cables so you can control your camera remotely with the slider. We'll talk about that. I've had some issues with that, but I think it's user error but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But before we dive into this, let's slide into the past and look at the role camera sliders have played in content creation over the past decade because prior to sliders being commonplace, the only way to really get that kind of motion was to use something like a dolly, which was very expensive, very inaccessible to a lot of people, and when DSLR cameras started being capable of shooting video and you started having these big sensors and these awesome lenses and things started looking much better than they had before for the average person. As in now that quality of video was accessible to everybody, camera movement then needed to evolve as well. And I can remember my first introduction to a camera slider was a Film Riot video about how to make your own camera slider using like PVC pipes and stuff. I really thought that would be an awesome tool to have and I wanted to be able to practice some of those camera moves myself, but I didn't really trust myself to make a decent PVC pipe camera slider at the time, even though I don't really think it was that hard. Fortunately, not long after, one of my other early favorite YouTube channels, Dave Dugdale did a review of the Canova K2 camera slider. And this thing was relatively affordable at the time. I think it was about $200, $250. It's very big, but that means the camera has a lot of room to slide around, which means you can get a lot more movement into your shot. It's incredibly well built. It's very, very smooth. It's got a ruler on the side. It's got a level built into it. It's even got a compass over here. If you're trying to do astrophotography, it can mount to light stands, tripods. It's really, really versatile. At the time, I think they had some rudimentary electric motor components you could attach to this. I didn't have the budget for that, so I never did it. I just had the manual slider. But when I watched Dave's video and I saw what he was able to do with it, it was a much more polished thing than the DIY version. And this is something that I thought, okay, it's gonna be worth spending the money to invest in that. And I think that was in 2012 or 2013, and I ended up using this slider exclusively all the way through like 2019. Camera sliders at the time not only increased production value, but they also increased the wow factor of video production. Oddly enough, I like to compare camera sliders to drones because when drones first came out, like consumer accessible drones, the early phantoms, the ones you had to put like a GoPro on, it didn't really matter that the footage didn't look great and was super shaky and you really couldn't cut that footage in with higher end cameras and have it match really well. None of that mattered because up until then, the only way you could get aerial shots like that was to like rent a helicopter, which again was something that is kind of out of the realm of possibility for the average person, like the average video production person, independent filmmaker, content creator, you're not gonna charter a helicopter just to get a couple shots. And then drones came out 
and people were now able to get aerial shots from all these different locations where you wouldn't even be able to fly a helicopter if you wanted to. I can remember watching drone videos where it was not even about anything, it's just montages of aerial footage, and the videos had like hundreds of thousands of views because it was an insane new technology. The technology matured over time, became more accessible, and then what happened was there was like a fatigue with drones because it didn't matter that you had a drone shot, everybody had drone shots, everybody had access to drone shots. What mattered was what you were doing with it. Is it actually contributing to the purpose, the thing you're trying to communicate, or is it just kind of gratuitous drone shots that you know we've all seen a thousand times? The same thing is kind of happening right now with FPV drones. Seeing those FPV shots is amazing, but it's starting to get more and more popular. I have a feeling you're gonna see a point where it's like, okay, we saw the FPV thing, cool, but like, what is it really doing? What is its greater purpose? And then it kind of just settles into the workflow. Obviously drones are still popular. FPV drones are gonna be popular. I don't mean to drone on about drones, but I think it's relevant to camera sliders because there was a period of time where it felt like every shot you saw in different videos was a slider shot. And then that kind of got a little bit overdone. People were used to seeing, wow, the camera's moving past something in the foreground. Oh my gosh, like there's an interview and the camera's sliding back and forth. And again, it just sort of settled in. And that's sort of what happens. New technology shows up, it disrupts everything, and then it finds its place in people's workflow. And sometimes it drops off entirely, but with things like drones and sliders, these are incredibly valuable tools. And a big reason I wanted to make this video was not just to talk about the Shark Slider Nano, but to also address some online conversations I've seen where people have kind of mentioned like, oh yeah, sliders, I remember those. Sliders are so over, like I have, who uses sliders anymore? And I personally use sliders in basically every single video I make, especially because I do a lot of tabletop product photography, which I did an entire video about that you can check out right here. And for me, I would absolutely consider a slider an essential tool. And using the Canova is great, but there's a couple things you might notice about this. It's really big, so taking it places is difficult, and it is a fully manual slider, so you have control over everything. But in order to get a shot that worked, I was finding myself having to do four or five different takes because it's hard to keep the speed consistent. Sometimes you might bump something. And I was also trying to do stuff where like the camera's pushing in as I set something down in the frame, so now I'm trying to use the slider and move something over here and move the camera as well. It was getting really, really tough and taking a lot of time, and so I wanted a motorized slider, which also meant the camera can move when I'm not next to it because in the time since this thing had come out, motorized sliders became a lot more accessible and a lot more reliable. And so I got the Edelkrone Slider 1, which is, look how compact this thing is. It's basically the size as just one of the legs of the Canova slider it is the entire Edelkrone slider. And to me, this was revolutionary for a few reasons. It is smaller, so you're not gonna get as much movement, but if you compose your shots properly, that's not really an issue. This can fit in a lot of camera bags pretty easily, and having a motor on your slider, having the camera be able to move without you touching it, that was a total game changer for me because now you can get shots consistently over and over again. It's kind of like having a robotic camera. You can just duplicate things, it's awesome for some visual effects, some stuff like that, but also those shots that I was doing, you know, four or five or more takes of, now I could get in one or two takes. And since it's motorized and you can automate it, that also means I can be in front of the camera while the camera's moving. So I started using a motorized slider for live streams because you can set the camera up on a loop where it's going back and forth. And then while you have one long shot that could otherwise be kind of boring, there's at least some movement there. You got like a parallax effect going on. And if you've ever used an Edelkrone product before, I did do a review on this slider right here. They are very well built, but this also comes with some frustration. This usually retails for about $500, but I got it on a B&H Photo deal of the day. I do notice Edelkrone products pop up on deal of the day pretty often, so if you're interested in one, that's a great way to get one at a slightly reduced price. I believe I paid about $350 for it. So for a motorized compact slider, it also takes the same LPE6 batteries as my Canon cameras. So same battery, same charger. And while this slider did totally change things, I was able to get such smoother shots. I've heard people talk about micro jitters with this and I 
on either of these motorized sliders, have not had any problem with that. Things are nice and smooth. The only time I had issues with jitters in my camera was when I was using the manual slider. And one quick tip when you're editing slider footage is if you look at the edge of the frame in your editor, that makes it easy to see if things are jittering and shaking, if things are speeding up and slowing down too much. And that can help you find the best shot to use, but also I recommend just adding in a stabilizer. So usually in Final Cut Pro, I'll put my slider footage in and then I'll just add a stabilizer to it, which just really helps things look kind of like heavy and locked down and makes the movement make more sense and it becomes a lot less distracting and a lot more immersive, which is kind of the goal. You don't want people to be distracted by all of the camera stuff and all the movement that you're doing, right? Now, as someone who had spent many years using a manual slider, the motorized slider really, really leveled things up. However, it wasn't perfect because this just slides back and forth. In order to add some panning movement, you need to buy the head one, which Maybe about six or seven months after I got this slider, I found the head one on a B&H deal of the day. And now you have a slider system that can slide and pan, and that really does open up some extra possibilities. However, the problem with these Edelkrone sliders is that, as you might notice, there's no buttons on them. They even point to the lack of an on-off switch as almost a sort of feature, but let me tell you, it is annoying. These are mainly app controlled, and the app works pretty well, however, it's annoying because you have to connect it and set it up and it's supposed to work where if you have multiple Edelkrone products together, the app automatically like pairs them and then creates an interface that works. So if you have the slider and the head, it will create an interface that lets you slide and pan and control all that movement. I think this was another 250 or $300 on the deal of the day. And then Edelkrone released this little remote which was another like $120. And that way you don't need to use the app. You can do everything through the remote. You can pair everything. This works great and it's it's so well built. It's like this little beefy metal remote. However, it takes AAA batteries and it eats through batteries like crazy. I've basically never seen this with a battery gauge that says anything other than almost about to die. And of course, the more parts you have, the more batteries you need. So now this takes two batteries to do this right here. So to be totally honest with you, as nice as the head one is, I hardly ever use it because setting it up is a headache. But the slider itself I used very, very regularly for about a year and a half up until the Shark Slider Nano showed up in the mail and took a bite out of the Edelkrone. And while we're talking about all these different sliders, let's slide into the sponsor of today's video, which is Artlist. If you know me, you know I don't do many sponsored videos, but you might also know that I've used Artlist for many, many years. So all the music you're hearing in today's video is from Artlist and all of the tracks will be listed in the video description in case you hear something you like and you wanna use it in one of your own videos. If you're unfamiliar with Artlist, they are an amazing royalty-free music service that has probably just about the best licensing you can ask for. All the songs you download while you have an active subscription come with a perpetual, nearly universal license, which means you can use them in just about everything you can think of. Videos, podcasts, commercial work, YouTube videos, monetized stuff, non-monetized stuff. Their library is always growing and always being updated, and they also will sometimes release creator packs of just assets and things to help you level up the quality of your videos. They really understand video production people and filmmakers and try to create stuff that's gonna help out that community as much as possible. So if you're interested in Artlist, there is a link in the description that will get you two additional months on your annual subscription. And let's slide into the next section of this video all about the Shark Slider Nano's fantastic features. Because sharks have fins. And just some basic specs that I think are important right off the bat. The Shark Slider is rated for a horizontal payload of just over seven and a half pounds. And it's also made to be mounted vertically, whoa, which has a payload capacity of just over five and a half pounds. So it's a pretty sturdy thing. As soon as I took it out of the packaging, the first thing that struck me was how well built it is. All of these sliders that I have, the Canova, the Edelkrone, and the Shark Slider are really well built, but this one really seems to be built either by people or with input from people who use camera sliders regularly because there's so many quality of life features and improvements on this that it is everything I had in my mind when I originally got my Canova slider and I thought like, this is what I'm gonna be able to do and down the line I can add motors to it, I'm gonna have all these motorized camera shots. This does all that just straight out of the box. 
and the ease of use and reliability that I thought I was gonna get with the Edelkrone. Again, this has right out of the box. How many pounds is 2.15 kilograms? The whole thing itself weighs about 4.7 pounds without a camera or a tripod head attached to it. So it is, you know, a little bit heavy, but not anything that's too difficult to carry or move around. And when there's not a camera attached, it's a pretty nifty compact unit, especially if I take off the battery. This is pretty much what you need to travel with. Obviously one of the benefits of a small slider like the Edelkrone is that this could potentially fit in a camera bag. It's, you know, the size of a big telephoto lens basically. This thing's not gonna fit in a camera bag, but it does come with a nice compact case that works really well. And that's much easier to travel with than something like this, which honestly just becomes a hassle. If it's a hassle to take with you, that means you're probably gonna take it less, which means you're probably gonna use it less. If something is easy to use and something is easy to have with you, then that means you're probably gonna use it more. And that is really one of the best things about this is just how friggin' simple it is. There are so many nice features on here. As you can see, there's a bubble level here. That is very, very helpful because there's also two little feet on the end, which will let you level things out if it's slightly uneven. There are two quarter 20 and one 3 8 inch mount on the bottom, so you have all kinds of different options for stability. You also have tension controls for the bottom sled and the top sled. When the slider's sitting on a flat surface, you have the ability to slide across the entire length, but if you have the slider mounted on a tripod or a stand, then it actually increases in length because it kind of moves over. So instead of just going the length of the slider, it now goes almost twice as long, which is super cool, but also potentially dangerous because if you have this on you know, a tripod or something and you balance it with your camera here and then suddenly the whole thing moves over here, the weight shifts. So it's a very good idea to make sure you're using a really stable tripod or stand when you have this mounted. And it's a really good idea to make sure that you're using sandbags or some kind of weight to keep things from tipping over. You can mount anything with a 3 8 inch or quarter 20 mount here because it's got this kind of awesome little system where the 3 8 inch mount is right there, but if you're not using that, it just slides down and then there's a quarter 20. So you don't have to add any adapters, you don't have to change anything, it's all just built in right here. On this end, you've got this little thing here which locks the slider in place. So if you're gonna be traveling with it, you just turn that to the lock position and then it locks into place. Sometimes you need to wiggle it a little bit before things click into place, but then it's locked down. And then over here, this is really one of the things that makes the slider incredible. You have a touch screen just built right in. You can control everything and set up everything right here. There is also an app, which I'll talk about later. It works really well. It has all this functionality built into it. But if you know me, you know I'm absolutely not a huge fan of having to rely on apps for things. It just seems to get in the way of my workflow. And this, you don't need it. Here, we'll set up the whole thing right now. Let's put the camera back on. And when you're putting your camera on, there's a little lock right here that if you hold that in, it will stop the slider from spinning. And that way you can tighten things down on it. It's also helpful if you don't need the slider to be moving and you wanna do some panning because this is too fast and too furious for me in terms of getting a smooth shot. So if you hold down the lock, now I can use the tripod head's friction to get a nice smooth pan manually, penually, anyway. Now I did mention that you can use a slider vertically via a mount on one of the ends, and this does work pretty well overall. However, I've found that depending on the weight of your camera, the motors can have a little bit of trouble. Sometimes when you go to start everything, it will just flash standby instead of actually starting. And you might need to give the motors or the carriage just a little bump to get things going again. And I definitely wouldn't leave your camera unattended while the slider is mounted vertically. One of the biggest benefits of the Shark Slider Nano is how quick and easy it is to set up. If I have an idea even minutes before a stream or a call or whatever, I can make it happen. Also, forgot to mention this, panning and sliding is built into this, so you don't need a separate head unit to add in panning. This can do pan, this can do sliding. To turn it on, you just press the power button and hold it down for about three seconds. There's a really quick sort of calibration process where the camera will move a little bit and it will just ask you to confirm that the camera's pointed perpendicular to the slider. You can just tap on that. The touchscreen responsiveness on this interface is really good. It's pretty much the same as like a smartphone. It's not a clunky touch interface and that's it. And if you wanna set your in and out points, you can either go to quick start 
or you can just press the power and function buttons at the same time, just give them a quick press, and then you just manually set your keyframe. So if I wanna start here, this is my A position, move it over here, this is my B position. I can then adjust the time. Right now it's set to 20 seconds. You can also choose to have it loop continuously. That's what I do when I use it during live streams and podcasts and stuff. And you can also choose to have it start from the A point and go to the B point or the B point and go to the A point. So press standby, then it gets ready. And then I just press start. And there we go. The Edel Crone is pretty quiet, but it definitely makes an audible noise that I can hear pretty easily while I'm recording, but it's never been picked up on camera. This makes a really quiet sound that I doubt is gonna get picked up on camera. I can hear it if I'm listening to it, but that's pretty much it right here. Now the camera's moving and I got basic slider action happening for my video. The control on here gives you some basic settings. You can do system calibration and it will adjust everything. You can also go into the motor settings and basically change how fast and responsive the motors are. I have everything set how it came out of the box. But if we wanna take things a few steps further, we have some other options here. And I have tried this with the Canon EOS R and the Sony a7S III, and I cannot get the slider to trigger the camera's shutter. I have a feeling this is user error because I've seen videos online where people are using it just fine, but I have been trying and trying and I honestly can't get it. However, I've still been able to use these features. So for example, time-lapse lets you set the interval of how long you wanna take your shots. You can do your output time, which is how long you want your final time-lapse to be. So we'll say, you know, we want a five second time-lapse here and we're doing 24 frames a second. It's just using the keyframes that I set earlier, but I could set new keyframes if I wanted to. And it will actually tell you when you start, in order to create the time-lapse based on the settings that I put in, it's gonna need to take 120 images, and that's gonna take 10 minutes to go through. So what it should be doing is if I had the camera connected, it should be triggering the shutter and then moving. So you might notice, you know, it says that it took a shot and then it moves a little bit, took a shot, moves a little bit. Now you can do motion time-lapses. I just can't get the actual trigger function to work. The EOS R and the Sony have built-in intervalometers. So what I've been doing is just setting up time lapses in the cameras. The camera will tell me, okay, this time lapse is gonna take 20 minutes. So then I just set up a time lapse in the slider that's gonna take 21 minutes. I press start on the slider, then I press start on the camera. It ends up working out just fine, and that way the slider's moving the whole time the camera's moving. Not as slick as it could be if I program everything here and it controls the camera. I don't know. And the other option is stop motion, which is really cool because if you've ever made a stop motion movie and you've tried to add in camera movement, it can be quite a challenge. So that's where kind of the automation of a slider really works out. So here we go. For example, I'm gonna do, it's sort of the same thing. I'm gonna create, we'll do a five second camera move because maybe I had a shot here and I want the camera to just move over here. And now this interface looks a little different. So it's telling me again, I need to take 120 shots to make that camera move happen, but it's not doing it on its own. So what it should be able to do is I set up my stop motion figures and then I press this next arrow and it takes the image and then moves the slider a little bit over. But if you're not using the remote triggers, you can just take the picture with your camera and then bump it over to the next one take the picture, bump it over to the next one, move your stuff, take the picture, bump it over to the next one. So you can still use it, you can still get that motion control, it's just you have to do this and that. Obviously that runs the risk of you shaking the camera because you're touching it. And while the slider does run on Sony's NPF style batteries, which are pretty common, a lot of us, if you have lights and things, you already have a bunch of these batteries around, it comes with a nice high capacity one. It can also run off of USB-C power, and it can also charge the battery off of that. So if the slider's powered off and plugged into power, it will charge the battery. If the slider's powered on and connected to power, it won't use the battery's power, but it also won't charge it. So it's kind of weird because you need to have the battery connected to use it with USB power. You can't just put your battery on a charger and then plug it in with USB. You need to have the battery connected and then USB, even though you're not using the battery or charging the battery, it needs to be there. Sort of a weird little quirk, not a big deal. And it's really nice to be able to use USB power with this because if you're doing something really long, you don't have to think about battery life at all. And the app is called iFootage Moco, which if you speak Spanish is sort of funny. And you can control the Shark Slider Nano or the Shark Slider Mini. It works really well. So I'm gonna use the Nano and just click connect. Since my slider is on, it should just see it. I, 
found it. I just click the connect button, it tells me the battery level and the firmware version. And then we've got an interface that's really similar to what is over here. I can turn on manual set key and then I can set the keyframes the same way that I would here. So I position the camera there, set my A keyframe position the camera here, set my B keyframe. And then you've also got these little like virtual joysticks that will let you pan and slide the camera here as well. So if you just wanna do a quick camera move and you don't want to set up keyframes and stuff, you can just use this to just make it do what you need to do really, really quickly. You can also then press the little info icon to change the sensitivity of everything. So that way you can dial it in exactly the way that you want it. And you can even save some battery power on the slider itself by tapping the LCD icon and it will turn off the LCD display, which as you can see is pretty responsive. So if I tap it, boop, it turns off right away. So it's, there's like very little lag or latency issues. It's, it's very, very responsive. And to me, this is exactly how an app should work where it adds some really cool functionality. It's super easy to use, but it's not something I have to use in order to use the device. So ultimately, who's the best person to dive into the world of the shark slider? I would say, you really don't wanna force a slider into your workflow if you don't need one. But for someone like me, it's an essential tool. And when I think back to my introduction to sliders back in like 2012, 2013, this is everything I wanted it to be, but it just couldn't, it didn't exist yet. And now it does, and it's right here. And even though it does seem pricey with that MSRP of $669, if you look at something like the Edelkrone, which retails for about 500, and then the head one, which is several hundred dollars more, plus if you need a remote, it's easily surpassing this cost point right here. Now I should say, at the time I'm recording this video, availability of the Shark Slider Nano is a little strange, mainly because of this thing that happened last year, the world kind of shut down for a bit, don't know if you've heard about that. So I'll put up to date links in the description where you can order or pre-order the Shark Slider Nano depending on availability, which changes all the time, but to me, this is absolutely worth it. At this point in time, I would not recommend a manual slider. So as much as I loved my Canova and as much as it was a really helpful tool that I used for many years, the benefits of a motorized slider just far, far outweigh a manual slider. And if you're gonna invest in a motorized slider, I can't think of a better motorized slider than this. It's, it's unreal just how good, how simple, how easy it is. But this has quickly become an integral part of my workflow that I kind of can't do what I do as easily or as effectively without it. And that's exactly what you want in a tool that you rely on. So there's so many different uses for a slider like this. It's one of my favorite things. I use it basically every single day, but if that's not enough and you want more, you can slide on over into this video right here and possibly even that video right there and check out some more things that I think will be helpful in leveling up your videos and your audio.